Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Leslie. The, uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, get the chance to discuss this topic of soil compaction and manure applications with you and Ekram uh, and everyone that's uh, uh, joining us today. So again, my name is Aaron Day. Uh, I'm gonna focus a lot of my portion of the next 20 minutes talking about the potential for soil compactions from field operations, so the application of manures, uh, as well as the level of consequences and timelines that one can expect when compaction happens and for several different types of approaches folks may use when trying to remediate compaction that occurs out in the field. Now, something that's very important to note just immediately here is that, you know, compaction is never intended. Uh, it's always a consequence, uh, a lot of times due to difficult situations, logistics, timing of rainfalls, you need to clean out uh, or do something storage wise with a uh, slurry pond or something like that. So it's always in the context of difficult decisions to be made. And so a lot of the information here is hopefully uh, we'll be able to help producers and your guidance for producers on weighing the, uh, the pros and cons of those difficult decisions that they have to make. So to get started, uh, I always like to talk about why is compaction important in the first place? And a lot of times with compaction, it has to do with macropores in the soil or soil aggregation. Basically, if you have a well-structured soil that has a lot of uh, macropores in it, a lot of large pore sizes, uh, that's seen as a healthy soil and has great benefit to crop production. Uh, but inevitably, because of these difficult situations and choices that producers have to make over the long term, the occurrence of compaction is very real. Uh, it, it can occur and it can persist. And so you can go from something that's very well aggregated, a lot of macropores, and it becomes more kind of a solid mass because that soil has become more dense. The bulk density has gone up. And I, I like to show sometimes these images like this one over here. This is a CT scan. So just like what you'd get at a medical facility when a doctor tries to look inside of a human without taking them apart to see how things are arranged. And in this image right here, this is a CT scan where all the white areas are macropores. These are root channels, earthworm pores, large pores that exist in that soil. And those macropores, they play an outsized function uh, uh, in the soil. So typically in a soil, you may only have less than 1% of all the pore spaces are macropores or large pores in between aggregates, but those pores themselves contribute up to 70% of the water movement, air movement uh, in the ground. So a little bit of compaction uh, and removing some of those macropores tends to go a long ways with soil function. And this can persist over time, as we just mentioned. These two CT scans right here, uh, both of them were taken uh, side by side in a field in Finland, and they were taken in between three to four feet below the soil surface. And you can see that there's macropores in both of these here, uh, both of these cores, but the one on this side has much less. And even the macropores that are there, they're, they're cut off, they're discontinuous. So there is kind of like a bubble underneath the ground that's not functioning for water flow or airflow very well uh, in it. And the only difference in between these two images is that uh, the one on this side with fewer macropores uh, visually evident, it had a one-time heavy equipment uh, uh, compaction event 29 years earlier. So it gives an idea that this can last for decades, especially when it occurs down deep uh, and underneath uh, high axle loads in agricultural fields. And this isn't overly surprising because if you look at the uh, uh, wheel loads or axle loads over equipment, uh, in previous years, previous decades, they've continuously gone up, whether it's combines or tractors or um, manure tanks, anything like that, bigger has become the norm and those axle loads go up with them. And that creates compaction is different this day and age than it was decades ago um, during field operations. And along with those larger equipment sizes, you can see that uh, soil compaction in the ground has also gone deeper and deeper over those same set of decades. So here, this is a soil depth uh, on the y-axis and decades 
on the x-axis in this 50 kilopascal stress, this is the same as a seven and a half pounds per square inch stress, pressure that's on the ground. And that's, an indi that's a very common stress that when we start seeing subsoils compact and uh, underneath axle loads. So you can see that this depth has gone down over and over, uh, over the decades. And I put this kind of orange bar right here in the middle as an indicator around 20 inch depth because you're hard pressed, anyone's hard pressed to find a tillage implement, a deep ripper or anything like that, that can go below a 20 inch depth. So our compaction due to high axle loads uh, is actually even getting below what you can mechanically ever reach. And so if you look at a kind of a cross section, a classic cross section of what these stresses look like down in the ground, you've got two tires here underneath relatively uh, uh, low axle loads and a, uh, um, uh, and a soil situation, but you can see it's kind of a bulb that goes underneath the ground where the stress is. And if you look at how dense a soil becomes after being drove on it, uh, these black dots here show kind of that bulb of stress that's caused a bulb of highly compacted soil uh, that's going to be hard on a crop. Now, when you come through with tillage implements, you can knock down the till depth down to a bulb density that's more friendly for a soil, but for that tillage implement to break through the ground and fracture and bust up that compaction, it actually has to press down at the same time. So you'll see that this plow pan, classic plow pan can get formed where it actually presses the bulk density of the soil up because it's causing more compaction immediately below that, uh, that till depth. Uh, and this is probably what happens in a lot of fields where we have high wheel traffic compaction uh, occurring in them. And this is a good opportunity right here just to mention a little bit of a difference in between uh, tires and tracks. So if you imagine that bulb of stress that's being applied onto the ground and the higher the stress, the more likelihood that you're gonna, that soil is gonna fail and compact. If you drive over a sensor that's at about six inch depth below the soil to measure it in pounds per square inch, when you, the front tire goes over, you'd see it uh, go up, back tire go over, you'd see the stress in the ground go up. And if you look at tracks, you can see something very similar. Now, the reason why that these stresses are similar here is because on the tractor, on the uh, tire side, those tires have been uh, inflated to a proper field condition. So down around 15 PSI or lower uh, tire pressure. When our radial tires are uh, properly inflated, they should be applying the same stress as what a track system would be providing in themselves. So there's, there's no benefit if the tires have been uh, properly adjusted in the first place compared to a track here. Uh, but oftentimes the uh, uh, tires aren't adjusted down to the field conditions because at higher speeds when you're driving at the road, uh, out in the roads, they need to be up somewhere around 40 or 50 PSI. That way the sidewalls don't, uh, uh, aren't compromised for them. But in the field, to really get the benefit out of the technology, the tire technology of radio tires that one is per purchased, if you don't drop them down to field uh, pressures around 15 PSI or less, you're actually not even using the technology that you paid for. So another image right here showing some actual data from a field uh, uh, day up in Ontario from Ian McDonald uh, did a handful of years ago. It was a great uh, field day up there. This is showing some sensors showing those same kind of data to where uh, in this one we've got a tandem manure tank uh, going over a couple sensors here. And you can see the tires when they go over on the manure tank, they bring up the stress down in the ground. Now, a couple things here, the green data is at six inch depth where a sensor was at, the black data is at the 12 inch depth, and then red data is at 20 inch depth in these soils. And this green line that goes across to 15 PSI, this is what they determined for that soil that was the topsoil uh, threshold for when compaction becomes very likely if you have stresses above it. And the subsoil, it's a lower pressure that it can handle down around uh, more close to that seven, eight, uh, PSI range before compaction becomes a high risk. And you can see that on this, uh, uh, at 40 PSI, out in the, these uh, uh, tandem manure tank, both 
uh, wheels when it goes over, the top sole is being exceeded, the subsole is being exceeded down below 12 inches. By the time you get to 20 inches, it's right on the threshold of whether or not it, it could be uh, at risk for compacting that subsoil. So this is a high risk compaction situation due to uh, the axle loads and the tire inflation rates. Now you take that same setup and look at it again, but now the only thing you do is that you drop that PSI down to 50 or 15 PSI, something more appropriate for in the field uh, operations. The topsoil pressure uh, is now uh, much lower. It's down close to that threshold. So this is a lower risk for compaction. The subsoil is still in that medium risk category. It's still above where it's at. And then 20 inches down, it's still a little bit below where that threshold's at. So what this demonstrates is that you can adjust uh, tire PSI um, and you can, that works very well uh, oftentimes for the topsoil, but for subsoil, the, the PSI isn't the main story. It's an influencer, it's a factor, but it's not the main story. That's where your axle loads become important, uh, keeping them down below 10 uh, uh, tons per uh, axle. Uh, if you have a well aggregated soil and you really want it down below five ton per axles, uh, if you have a poorly uh, structured soil, which are hard goals to hit, but that's the reality if you're looking at to minimize uh, effects of compaction. And there's a lot more great information for me in McDonald's uh, uh, field day, and there's actually a recording from uh, a few years ago uh, for this uh, same uh, webinar series that you can go at this website right here and check out Ian's uh, uh, great presentation and work there. Now those stresses are snapshots in time. That's the stress when that particular piece of equipment drove across the ground on that particular day under those particular soil moisture conditions. But as soil moisture changes, uh, the risk for compaction, uh, um, uh, the reality of does compaction actually occur underneath that stress also changes a little bit. So there's, of course, wetter soils are more prone to being compacted. So if we look at a diagram here to where we got bulk density on this side, the higher, the higher the bulk density, uh, and then we uh, get higher and higher soil moisture conditions all the way up to, uh, towards uh, saturation here. And this brown line would be what the bulk density of the soil is before any compaction occurs. Well, underneath dry conditions over here, no compaction occurs when you drive over it. Uh, but as you start getting a little bit of water, it'll compact more water, it'll compact more. Uh, up around field capacity is where it may compact the most. You get higher than field capacity, it actually comes down a little bit because water simply can't get out of the way fast enough. And water is incompressible underneath the agricultural loads. And so um, you're literally kind of standing on water when it's sopping wet out uh, in the field. But this is important to consider because oftentimes if you see ponded water out in a the field, then that's obviously uh, the main thought is I'm high risk for compaction. I'm gonna try not to drive out on it. But as soon as that water disappears and it's not ponded anymore, then oftentimes there's that tendency to say, all right, it's good to drive out now. When in reality, that is probably the most vulnerable conditions for compaction to occur because a little bit of water's drained and particles can actually slip into those air pockets and compact down deeper. So once ponded water's off the field, you probably want to give it a few more days still yet, if you can, to get down in this little bit drier condition to where uh, compaction goes, uh, risk uh, becomes even lower. And something to keep in mind is that I mentioned earlier that there's different PSIs for well aggregated and poorly aggregated soils. So that topsoil versus subsoil back in Ian's graphs, but then also for the axle loads, um, a strongly aggregated soil is less prone to compaction than uh, a weakly aggregated soil. And so these curves of, of moisture, how risky it is, for compaction to occur can be shifted down and changed based on management. And Ekram is probably going to mention a few things uh, more on that uh, uh, later on. So how long does compaction last? Uh, it can last for a long time. So oftentimes right after compaction occurs, you may see a drop in yields about 20, 30%, and then it will start recovering over the next uh, two, three, four years. But then even afterwards, you can bring down yields uh, in subsequent years when there's a lot of 
Uh, for, for example, on this site in Minnesota, two of these years are drought years. One is excessive water year. So when you're either drought or a lot of water, that persistent subsoil compaction below what you can reach is still at a consequence even a decade later. And we can often often see this in aerial photographs. So a great colleague of mine, Jody DeJong Hughes, who co-authored the uh, Upper Midwest Compaction Guide with me a few years or a couple years ago, uh, she goes up in airplanes every year and takes photos of uh, fields in her neighborhood. And you can see the wheel track left over. So this is in uh, western Minnesota. If you zoom in, you can see the planting direction. You can see traffic. Uh, old traffic directions in there. You can see older traffic directions from multiple years past. So you can visually see it. And that compaction cuts down on your yield bearing uh, uh, agronomic components. So in something like corn here out of some of these similar fields, uh, shorter ear sizes, less grain fill, things like that, that'll impact those yield components. But when it does happen, the main thing that you definitely have to do in a field like this is that you have to level it out for the next seed bed to be able to plant in. You can't plant into something that's rutted up. Um, but Jody and I and a previous graduate student of mine, Umesh Acharya, we did a economic projection uh, for North Dakota and Minnesota. I used to live in North Dakota for nine winters. And we did an economic projection after a really wet harvest where there was widespread ruts occurring. And we wanted to see, based on literature, kind of what the 50th percentile worth of consequences on crop yields would be. And it's around 21%, which you can expect. And when we take that and we apply it, uh, uh, the cost for leveling out the field with tillage to fill in those ruts, and then two years ahead, projections of direct economic costs to uh, corn and soybean producers in Minnesota and North Dakota, um, we did an economic projection on that. And so this 0.1 here uh, for corn and 0.1 for soybean here, that would be the equivalent of 10% of the land. So maybe 10% of all fields or one out of 10 fields, what would the economic cost be? And these are in hundreds of millions, these are in millions of dollars here. So even for just 10% of the land, we're looking at uh, about $300 million cost to producers for corn. On soybeans, we're a little bit lower, uh, maybe 250, close to $300 million of economic cost to producers. In the end, that one tough decision harvest probably has led to uh, half a billion dollars worth of economic cost directly to the producers of that two state area. So tough decisions, tough, tough things happen, uh, but what's the options for breaking up that compaction? One of them is bio drilling with roots. The idea is to get in root uh, crops that are able to break through compaction layers, and there's a lot of opportunities for this, but one of the things to know is that that's a multi-year effort to break up that compaction because the roots have to form the new root, uh, uh, new root channels, and then they have to have time for that root to rot out of it to open it up for the subsequent cash crops. And this usually takes uh, several years to, before you start seeing it effective. Another option is natural cracking from clays uh, uh, during the middle of like droughts in the midsummer. Now this is opportunity for some people and not for others. If you have cracking soils, you know it. Uh, but if you look at a soil and you zoom in to an electron microscope uh, image, you've got different clay uh, species in it. If you've got some two to one clays like illite, they're only a, mil, a one nanometer spacing in between individual clays. That's close enough to where they won't shrink and uh, uh, swell uh, and crack. But smectites that are just 1.3 nanometers uh, spacing in between, that's just enough separation where shrinking and swelling can be tremendous. And you can start fracturing and breaking uh, soils through compaction uh, down deep. And they usually, a little bit of uh, crack at the surface is usually tremendously deeper than what that width of the surface is. To demonstrate this, here's an image up by uh, Fargo taken by David Hopkins. This is a wastewater treatment plant that was being redone. All these black areas in the soil right here, that's not shadows in there. This is actually cracks that had opened up and then filled in with topsoil that sloughed off into them. And the original soil surface, soil surface is about one or two feet above the sharpshooter right here. So cracks can go tremendously deep and shrink swell soils. Here's another image up by the uh, Manitoba border uh, in uh, North Dakota on a surface drain to where you can see the same. 
but that means you got to wait until a, uh, a drought comes along and those cracks really open up and gets really deep compaction uh, crack through it. The other option is freeze thaw, but this is more of a misnomer this uh, day and age because back in the day when axle loads were often 10 tons uh, per axle or less with light equipment, it could break up compaction that was in the topsoil. So for freeze thaws that work during the winter, you need many freeze thaw. You might need two dozen freeze thaws to actually break up compaction. Well, even in a place like Fargo, where it's tremendously harsh uh, winters up there, in that topsoil depth, you can get half a do you can get a dozen, two dozen freeze thaw cycles within uh, winter. But down below that, where that wheel traffic compaction really pushes deep, it freezes once, it thaws once. So you may be waiting a dozen to two dozen years before winter can actually do anything down deep. It's just not effective. Winter freeze thaw does not take care of subsoil compaction with our size of equipment that we have. And then the last thing here uh, real quick is uh, deep tillage. This is often used to go after deep compaction. Uh, it has poor odds of working and little gain when it does. And I just wanna give a little example here from a study. This is a meta-analysis of over 1500 uh, sites that were compared. And right here is uh, the yield. Uh, one right here means no gain. This is after compaction had occurred. Everything in blue is where there was a benefit from the yields uh, uh, due to deep ripping. Uh, but then the red is the negative side. You actually lost more yields by deep ripping. And so there's a lot of red here. It is risky. But even if we run a scenario to give this more context, if you use that 50th percentile yield loss of 21% that we talked about briefly earlier and applied that to a situation, let's say that you had 180 bushels per acre corn yield goal in an area and you applied that 21% consequence uh, from 50% severity on compaction, you drop down to about 142 bushels per acre. If you deep tilled this and you hit the global mean, so this is a uh, global median. This means that uh, half the people did better than you, half the people did worse than you on deep ripping. It's only a 4% gain. So you go up to about 148 bushels per acre. That's not much to write home about or be happy about for the time and diesel that was spent in doing that extent of deep ripping, especially when you probably didn't even hit the bottom of the compaction layer. To fully gain the yields back, you'd need to be up 27% uh, increase. If you looked at other yield consequences, so a little bit lighter, 20, 25th percentile, or a lot more severe, the 75th percentile uh, consequences of compaction, you still need to be in this top bracket, which is the top 25 percentile performance for deep tillage. Uh, everyone thinks that they're in that category, but three out of four folks are continuously going to be disappointed. And when does this occur? It's really a combination of things that have to happen for that top 25% to really play out. One, there has to be a root limiting layer there. It has to be due to compaction, not something else that a producer suspects may be compaction. If you suspect it's compaction, it's really not. Deep ripping will push you into the negative, uh, into the red area. Uh, the soils also lack significant quantities of silt. silt. Silt loam soils do not behave well with deep ripping because that bar just smears it. And the main insult to compaction is a smeared uh, compacted soil. Also, it gives the illusion of uh, uh, resources kind of limited in the surface. If you had uh, your topsoil fertility was pretty poor, then that deep ripping may push you in a positive, but that's only because the plant can reach more of those nutrients down low. It was more of an indicator of something was off with the fertility program. Same thing with a significant drought that happens that next year. The plants needed to get down and get water. That's more of that consequence that previous uh, uh, layers of deep uh, compaction exist below what you can mechanically reach. So you have to hit this combination to be in this top 25 percentile, which is just low odds. So if you take home messages for my portion here is that modern wheel loads are high these days and can push compaction deeper than what's often uh, thought that it can. Avoidance is always preferred over relying on remediation methods because it is a timely process, uh, but there is realities on whether or not it can be avoided due to on-farm logistics. 
Uh, but when things do get tough uh, logistics wide, keeping loads light. So maybe instead of a tandem uh, manure tank, use a quad manure tank, something like that. Adjusting those tire pressures, very important. Uh, and then fewer field passes uh, uh, to help uh, not spread the compaction love around, if you will. And then if you do have compaction, leveraging some of these natural alleviation mechanisms like bio drilling and natural soil cracking, if you have the right mineralogy, can actually uh, uh, make up for what tillage can't ever reach.